Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is November 30, 2021, and in this video we're going to do a little commentary on Kyle Kalinske's video called Kyle's Case Against Doomerism. Not sure exactly what he's talking about, but we'll take a look. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe, and consider supporting on the Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. So, as usual, I have not seen any of this video. A couple of people recommended it to me. And to be honest, I could stand to lighten it up a little bit on the channel. I've been doing lots of audiobooks, and uh, I love doing the audiobooks. And to me, it is the heart of the channel, and I've been trying to actually swing it back in the direction of, you know, the majority of the videos being audiobooks. And in fact, I have a number of readings picked out, kind of an ambitious schedule uh, for the next five or six weeks. Plan to get a lot of good stuff up on the channel. Then I have a, sort of a larger project in mind. I'll probably discuss more about that later. But anyway, it has been a while since we've done any Hanging with the Sock Dem Gang. And, uh, you know, seeing where the differences are on the broader left between socialists, anarchists, and social democrats. So in this case, we have kind of King Sock Dem, Kyle Kalinske of Secular Talk. I guess we can just jump right into this video. I'm not really sure what to expect. Uh... Kyle Kalinske talking about doomerism. I mean, this guy's whole thing is just, you know, we need to elect better Democrats. To clarify my own position, um, here's where I think that we're at in the U.S. left. In the post-2008 situation, you know, that's now 13 years, so pretty good stretch of time for, like, the recent past. Economic collapse, people start talking about capitalism again, which, for those of you younger, may not remember. People didn't even talk about capitalism at all. Prior to 2008, really, it was not very much at all in the U.S. So you have that. And then I would say that the first step in terms of a mass movement was Occupy. Now, Occupy had a lot of problems, but you saw people coming out in droves to articulate their grievances with the system, to talk about capitalism, and to start to have mass discussions with strangers, with neighbors about, hey, what are we going to do about this. I would say that then step two was the Bernie campaign, which took a lot of the same issues which were articulated during those Occupy years and amplified them and helped to refine them. And, you know, it, it brought it to a larger audience, got it more onto cable TV and all that stuff, really brought a lot of those grievances to everyone around the country and got people realizing, hey, there's a lot of people being affected by this, who want change. Unfortunately, Bernie Sanders and the squad, you know, they took that energy and they fed it into the Democratic Party, which exists to crush exactly those kinds of movements. So that's not good. What I say is that step three needs to be the Bernie moment, but this time outside the Democratic Party. We need to have a movement with speakers that can fill stadiums, and we need a coalition of united left groups. And this cannot include the Democratic Party. Uh, you know, groups even like CPUSA advocate for a popular front against fascism, which they try to limit to just the Republican Party. And don't get me wrong, I hate the Republican Party. And I think that, yeah, they're definitely leaning in the direction of fascism in many ways. The problem is that the Democratic Party doesn't actually want to do anything about that. We've been in this situation since George W. Bush. For about 20 years, the Democrats have been talking about, hey, threat of fascism, but then they don't do anything. So if you're trying to do a popular front against fascism involving the specific bourgeois party of the Democratic Party, you are sabotaging your own movement against fascism. So we need a united front of left groups who are not involved with the Democratic Party so that we can engage in class struggle uh, without corporate chaperoning, if you will. The working class needs to figure out ways that we can effectively engage in class struggle in the 21st century without the control that, you know, you feed things into the Democratic Party, they squash them. They don't let you do anything. So... In my opinion, that's what we need to do. Step three is the Bernie movement again, but this time not trying to take over the Democrats, 
but form an independent left where we can actually maybe get something done. So, you know, whether it's CPUSA or Secular Talk Kyle Kalinske, I do not think that, you know, working with the Democrats, whether you think you're going to change the party or whether you think you're just going to work with them to keep Republicans out, either way, it doesn't work because trying to run people in the Democratic Party, there's a real limit to how much you can do within the party to change them at all. And then as far as working with them, quote, against fascism, well, what do they do? I mean, they don't actually do anything to stamp out fascism. So you can fantasize all you want about a popular front against fascism if the party that you're trying to cozy up to, the Democratic Party in this case, isn't actually on board with your anti-fascist agenda. Well, that's not really going to serve you. However, a variety of left groups are and we need to finally make this our time. I mean, we have the technology. We need to just stand up, take the spotlight. And all of the various left anti-capitalist groups need to come together uh, for the purpose of defeating fascism. From there, you know, how do we remake society if we're successful? You know, the differences between the Social Democrats and the anarchists and the communists are going to come out at that point. But I do agree that the rising threat of fascism is real and concerning. So let's see where Kyle goes with this. Uh, but I did want to put that out there up front. Here we go. So I want to take a moment here to give everybody my case against doomerism, or what I like to call political nihilism, which is this idea that, well, things are so screwed. Things are so messed up. Things are so terrible. What's even the point? I'm totally checking out mentally. I'm Dunsky. It's a wrap. Um, and it's almost like they view you as naive if you think there's even a little bit of hope or are trying to strategize to get us to a place where we're, we have a better situation. Uh, those are the doomers. Those are the political nihilists. Uh, and one of the things they like to do is watch from afar and judge everybody who's involved in one way or another, almost as like your simpletons for even being involved. Because obviously with my superior intellect, I'm sitting on the sidelines and watching and judging and all of you have not reached my my uh, amazing genius brilliant level where i see the whole picture and none of you silly people do these are the doomers these are the nihilists so my case against doomerism is is very straightforward okay before kyle gets into that um first of all this sounds like it could be an interesting video so i'm looking forward to this but he's throwing around a few terms here that i'd like to push back slightly on at least the way that i use them and the way that other people i know use them so specifically doomerism and nihilism. I don't think that these are the same thing. And I also think that the way he's kind of using them. All right, let's start with doomerism. So when you say we're doomed, that does imply that there's nothing that you can do to change the situation, you know, accept your fate, roll over, just take it, whatever. Uh, obviously, as a revolutionary, you know, minded person, uh, I do. I mean, you just look around, look at history, you know, studying history, you see revolutions are possible and they have enemies. Enemies fight against revolution, but they're possible. You know, um, speaking of being, you know, having a secular position, I don't know that Jesus is coming back. I think that, uh, you know, we've got to kind of make the world into what we want it to be. And unfortunately, you know, as far as co-creating the world, with other people in it, uh, some people have vastly more power at their disposal. This is capitalism. Capitalism puts vast amount of wealth in private hands. That translates into political power, etc. So we're up against people who, individuals, who then, you know, form little groups uh, and they pool their resources and they're able to defend their class interests, which include private property. Our interests are not having private property, things like that. And I don't mean personal property, I mean industry, you know, things that really should be common property, but are being treated as private property. People owning things privately that they cannot possibly operate themselves. That's what we mean, abolish private property. Okay, we shouldn't have that system. So, you know, doomerism and having a revolutionary mindset, those are opposed because, you know, we know that revolutions are possible. Therefore, there's no need to feel like everything is doomed. I mean, things 
might suck and the odds might be stacked against us. But that hasn't stopped revolutions from happening before. Because, you know, you pick your day. I mean, you wait, you organize, and imperialists have moments of weakness. Then we take advantage of that. We just saw massive uprisings last year that seemed to come out of the blue. I mean, to me, I've said it before, a day that there isn't a mass uprising in the United States, and indeed in many other countries, is a day that doesn't entirely make sense to me. But as Lenin wrote, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, there are years when decades happen and decades when years happen. It just sometimes history becomes unstuck and then a bunch of stuff happens that, you know, the grievances had been building over a long period of time. Just because nothing's happening now doesn't mean that nothing's going to happen tomorrow or next week or next month. History is full of surprise twists. So, you know, these are all arguments against doomerism. We need to study, organize, agitate, educate, and prepare because the moment will come when you just know this is the time to act. And, you know, I wish that those opportunities were more frequent. We work with the world that we have. All right, so that's doomerism for me. Um, about nihilism, I think that Kyle was kind of getting it wrong and using it interchangeably with doomerism. So to me, the difference is that uh, nihilists are people who believe that maybe existence or human existence or something really fundamental anyway to human experience is meaningless and basically comes out of nothingness and nothing really matters. And in a political sense, this usually means people who may have what seems like a revolutionary outlook in that they want to tear down existing structures, but there's not really a positive assertion of what should be built in its place other than just, you know, the people's will or something like that. Obviously, as Marxists, um, we have a pretty specific position of, you know, dismantling capitalism, but then building socialism in its place. So this is not a nihilistic position whatsoever. Um, I would contrast political nihilism, which, you know, just says destroy everything, something will come out of it, um, to doomerism in that somebody could really have any political outlook and be a doomer. For example, you could be a doomer Marxist, uh, not a very good Marxist, I would say, but you could basically want uh, a socialist revolution, but for one reason or another, convince yourself that it's not possible. So you could, you know, basically believe that we're doomed because of whatever reason. And again, I think that this does actually contrast with the basic revolutionary optimism of Marxism. But anyway, you could somehow, you know, wind up in this position where you want some kind of pro-social revolutionary change but also believe that it isn't possible and that we're doomed and that nothing will change. So that's super different from nihilism. Um, also, I don't think that nihilists are necessarily doomers. Nihilists believe in nothing. They believe that everything is sort of meaningless or arbitrary. And um, I'm not sure you'd even be bothered by the notion of doom. I'm not sure you would believe in doom. So anyway, just kind of putting that out there as a preface. Um, I think he's talking about cynicism. I think he's talking about pessimism. But I do think that uh, these are distinct, particularly from political nihilism. Okay. So first, a few points as to how it's actually not even necessarily as bad as we all think it is. Now, don't get it twisted. It's bad. <laughs> like, I'm not trying to, you know, say puppies and rainbows and let's all hold hands and sing Kumbaya here. That'd be ridiculous. But we just got the story recently John Deere workers went on strike. Tens of thousands of John Deere workers went on strike. Um, and they won huge concessions. They won concessions in a contract that I thought they would accept. They didn't. They voted it down. F I think 51 to 49, they voted it down. And John Deere said, we're walking away from the table. We're done with these people. Then a couple days later, they said, did we say we're walking away? I mean, what happened? Well, me and Craig was down by the Safeway, and the sun was in my eyes, and now we're back at the table. Shh. And so they came back to the table, and then... The John Deere workers got even more out of them. So they got an immediate pay raise, doubled to 10%, two future 5% raises, cost of living adjustments now when they didn't have them previously, an $8,500 bonus, pensions restored for new hires, and in retirement, they got up to $250 a month extra and $2,000 bonus per year extra with, of service. 
So they got so much in this strike. And they were willing to stand out there in the cold, in solidarity, hand in hand, and achieve a massive win. A massive win. So this is, for the first time in a long time, a labor union actually notching a tremendous victory. I mean, really, ever since Reagan and onward, labor union, there's been a war on labor unions. They've been playing defense. But as Jonah Furman, the labor reporter, now says, no, no. Now we're witnessing an era. We're seeing a sea change. Now they're going on offense. And so the next thing that they're going to try to get, probably in the next round of negotiations, contract negotiations, is to get rid of the two-tier 1997 um, the two-tier system that they had, where like new workers didn't get the same benefits as the old workers, but now the old workers want to stand in solidarity with the young workers and say, no, we're going to, everybody gets the same benefits. So th this is beautiful. Now, that's one piece. There's also a bunch of other strikes going on. And, you know, solidarity to the strikers, and I hope that they win great terms. Because it's not a coincidence that when labor unions were the strongest in our country, we had the healthiest working class and middle class. There's a direct correlation between unionization rate and how well the working class does. So it's not all bad. Now we're seeing some shifting in the right direction. People are taking matters into their own hands with their fellow workers and standing in solidarity and getting more, you know, getting a bigger piece of the pie that they deserve. Okay, I'm going to pause right there. I'm a little bit more mixed on this point, and let me explain that. Um... I guess just basically it would take a little bit more for me to feel quite as positive as Kyle seems to be about this comes off a little bit to me as like desperate. Um, I think that this is great. Don't get me wrong. However, to say that the U S labor movement has been on defense, I think even that is wildly overstating. I mean, they've been massively concessionist, um, even concessionist doesn't quite do justice to the kind of downward spiral that the U S labor movement has been in for decades. Um, a lot of which honestly was preventable. I mean, yes, Reagan was a hard ass, but there's, there's a lot going on there. Um, that isn't so great. So yes, strikes good. Um, I'm just going to need to see a lot more of that before I start getting too excited about it. I mean, we're in an extremely bad situation right now. Um, the pandemic is entering what, like its fifth wave? And, um, you know, I've done a number of videos on that. Uh, nobody's even talking about it. You know, um, the cases are going up again. Deaths are going up again. It's really alarming. I mean, I've been saying all along, get the shot and keep wearing your mask and keep distancing. Um, I've almost stopped even bothering, which is demoralizing to me because it's just falling on deaf ears and, uh, you know, I don't know, at the risk of getting off topic, it, it's hugely upsetting to me. And at the risk of getting off topic, I mean, so Trump's out, Biden's been in for almost a year. Uh, I mean, can you tell the difference? I can't. Things are, I think, probably worse in some ways. They're better in some ways and worse than others. I mean, the U.S. is like still trying to overthrow Cuba and shit. Like things are not good. Like, the, you know, where's the harm reduction exactly? Um, because a lot of the shit just has not changed at all. Um, you know, and that's true of COVID policy as well. Now they're just, you know, uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, like get the shot. And I'm not really that supportive of people who don't get the shot, but the shot is one thing. Masks are another huge part of this. The administration is not pushing masks. They told everybody to go mask off like six months ago. Um, so I don't know. My head kind of spins, I guess, right now, really trying to interpret anything happening as positive at all. Because, I mean, no matter how bad your situation is, people are going to be fighting back. Like, it would be you know, the only time people don't fight back at all is like death. I mean, you know, final total loss. So, you know, finding a few instances of people fighting back. Uh, okay. I mean, that's totally normal. I don't think it's cause for massive celebration. So there's that. That said, I'm still against doomerism, but this is a super low bar and just way too low of a bar if we're trying to orient ourselves politically 
in late 2021, heading into 22. In fact, I would, you know, call people's attention back to the kinds of things that we were thinking about, uh, you know, a year, year and a half ago, about what was possible and what we were going to fight for. And then Joe Biden and, you know, the rest of the Democrats came in and just poured cold water over the whole thing. It was going to be fight for 15. It was going to be Bernie Sanders has a 100-day plan to hold Joe Biden accountable. Do you remember the last time anyone even mentioned Medicare for All on TV? Like, 24 hours after Bernie Sanders got out of the race, it was just gone and hasn't been mentioned since. In fact, the only time it got brought up was on Force the Vote, which I supported, uh, because they had the votes to do the thing at the time to keep Pelosi in the loop of being elected, well, having to run in the election for speaker until she agreed to do it, uh, put it up for a vote. And that's something you can agitate off of. And no, that was just, you know, shot down across the board. Well, what's the plan? You know, um, here we are. It's almost December 2021. And okay, you've got some strikes going on. But we need a lot more. And to me, the conversation is not so much, um, you know, about this doomerism. I guess let's get back to the video because, like I said, a few strikes is not really relevant. Let's also underline here the differences between the Marxist position and the Kyle Kalinske position, the social democratic position. Social Democrats believe in capitalism, basically. They believe in capitalism with regulations. They believe in capitalism with, you know, labor unions and stronger worker counterpower. But they believe that capitalists basically, you know, rich people should rule society and control industry, which is really common property, that they should control that as their private property and that they should run it for their own personal profit. That's what they believe. They just think that we should hold them in check a little bit more. Whereas socialists believe, no, no, no. If we're going to organize for power, then we need to just organize and remove the capitalists from power. Again, Jesus is not coming. We need to just run our own lives here. So that's a big difference between Kyle Kalinske's outlook. You know, capitalists should be in power, just somewhat regulated and restrained. I say no. <laughs> We need to take the capitalists out of power and make the working class the ruling class and suppress capitalism to the full extent that we possibly can, uh, which ultimately is fully. So that's where he's coming from. That's where I'm coming from. Let's continue the video. Now, beyond that, here's another um, piece of positive information. In the last election, remember when it was McCullough versus Yunkin in Virginia, there were some other elections that were going on uh, that day. and the DSA had endorsed a bunch of candidates and 69% of the candidates won that night. Now this was probably more the, the local level state level stuff, but that's great. That's good news. So that's another thing to keep in mind as we go through all the issues here. So those are the two pieces of very positive information that, Hey, there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Okay. Now what do we do moving forward? I have a lot of, Okay, so that was really it. <laughs> um, like I said, I just, I need a little bit more than that. If you're going to make a whole video that's like, hey, the ray of light, and then it's that small, it's like, eh, I feel like you just undermined your own case. So DSA endorsed candidates and then two thirds of them won. All right, but I mean, who were they? Were they actually any good? Um, you know, DSA endorsed them, but, and I know that they have certain criteria, but uh, yeah, anyway, that was it. I feel like this is kind of a damning with faint praise kind of situation. Like, hey, everybody, I got great news. Not all is lost, you know, and then it's so small and you're just like, I don't feel any different. So again, don't get me wrong. I'm not being doomer here. Let me say at this juncture, when I get any kind of hope about the overall task of ending capitalism ending imperialism, and building socialism. It's not really to the U.S. that I'm looking. This is, I would say, another difference between more of a socialist Marxist perspective and a social democratic perspective, particularly for a social democrat like Kyle Kalinske 
in the imperial core, the United States, is that the socialist perspective is more internationalist. When I get hope, it's from reading the history and current events of what's going on in the developing and exploited countries and how they're resisting, because I think that there's more real stuff happening there. You know, somebody made the point recently on social media of, uh, you know, if you had a real anti-imperialist candidate running in the U.S., probably a lot of people would turn on them because people in the U.S. would realize their living standards would be somewhat, at least, impacted if the U.S. and the rest of the imperialist core dealt fairly with the countries that they're exploiting militarily. You know, I mean, they, they use military force against these other countries. They use debt traps. They use puppet governments, neocolonialism. If the U.S. had to deal fairly, things would be more expensive. Now, we would eventually break down capitalism. We would have socialist revolutions. And then we would build a cooperative economy where price wasn't really the issue, you know. Uh, but for the short term, things would be different. And, you know, probably a lot of people wouldn't like and maybe wouldn't support that. Uh, and that has nothing to do with, you know, workers going on strike here in the U.S. to get a pay raise or something like that. And don't get me wrong, people have struggles trying to keep up with, you know, trying to afford a roof over your head and food on your plate. I mean, you know, clothes on your body that aren't tattered and falling apart. Uh, these are real things. But also, you know, pulling it back to the U.S.'s position in the global economy, um, there are some contradictions between the way that, you know, well, the economic the set of economic interests of workers in the first world and workers in the developing and exploited countries. So this is a conversation a lot of people don't want to have. Even some supposed parentheses, right-wing, you know, pseudo-Marxists. But definitely a lot of social Democrats don't want to go there. DSA, I know, has had problems with their internationalism. So this is another sort of point of contention. We can't just look at struggles going on within the imperialist core. We also have to look at the, you know, ramifications of the imperialist core versus the rest of the world. So that, for me, tends to be more of the hopeful scenario is listening to people talk about the U.S. and, you know, hearing their struggles. Before anyone asks, um, Breakthrough News is a channel that I tend to like. Can't endorse everything they do, but I think they have a lot of really interesting interviews. And, you know, if I'm looking for more of a long form news thing, that tends to be one of the places that I go if you're looking for something interesting. Anyway, let's get back to Kyle. Answers to this question. One of the simplest ones is this. You have to elect an enforcer to Congress. What's an enforcer? An enforcer is somebody who actually agrees on all the policy stuff that we talk about on this show all the time. But more importantly, not only are they with us on policy, they have that crucial leadership quality that all the lefties in Congress don't have and completely lack. Wait, there are, quote, lefties in the U.S. Congress? What the fuck are you talking about? Also, this is a person who is in deep denial of how the Democratic Party works, because believe me, that's what he's talking about. Kyle has stated many times that he doesn't think that working outside the Democratic Party works. Okay, well, you have basically the option of deluding yourself into thinking you're making some change within the Democratic Party. You are just doing exactly that. You're lying to yourself. Um, and then, you know, you sit around and pull at your hair going, why aren't they doing things? No, no, this is what the Democratic Party allows. Also, you're also looking at somebody who has wanted to be Jenk Uger for most of his adult life. Try and unsee it. And, you know, I, I don't care if I'm hurting any of their feelings. Some of them watch this show, but you need a leader who's willing to take the fire from the media from Democratic leadership and from the Republicans. And from my analysis of the situation, every time there's one lefty who says, you know what, I'm going to go out on a limb and do this thing. Then you get like eight of them that follow. You're like, yeah, yeah, me too, me too. 
but it always takes somebody with courage to do the right thing in the first place and somebody who's willing to be hated to do it. Willing to get all this crap from elites. And they're very rarely ever willing to do that now. So the, a good example I could think of is, and this is not even one that I necessarily agree with, but it illustrates the point well. So Cori Bush called for anybody who questioned um, the results of the election in Congress that they should be expelled. Basically not allowed in Congress anymore. No longer Congress people. Now, behind the scenes, when that idea was being floated around, virtually everybody was like, I, I, I don't want to do that. It took one person, Cori Bush, to say, actually, I do want to do that. She went out there and made that argument. And then, like, a bunch of other left Congress people were like, yeah, no, yeah, I'm, yeah, I want to jump in front of that parade. I want to lead because Cori Bush had gotten some, like, positive press over that. And so they're like, okay, yeah, now I'm on board with that. And so what we need is an enforcer, somebody who's not only correct on the policy issues, but somebody who's going to lead. Because here's the thing. Sometimes you go out on a limb and you do get shit on, not just by Democratic leadership, but also by Republicans and most importantly, the media. And so if we could just get one enforcer in there, you'd be surprised how many people follow when there's a leader. So if there was a leader who gave a press conference, who's a Democratic representative who said, listen, Joe Biden, we were talking about $7 trillion, $6 trillion bill. We compromised to $3.5 trillion. Now you want our vote for a $1.9 trillion bill? Wrong. My hard line is $2 trillion, but hey, you want my vote? Listen, I'm gonna make it very simple. Here's a list of our demands. You only get our vote. Me and my block, you only get our vote if you do these executive orders. Legalize marijuana, change it from Schedule 1 to Schedule 5. Free every federal nonviolent drug offender. Do that right now. Um, eliminate all student loan debt. Pardon Stephen Donzinger. Pardon Julian Assange. Pardon, uh, you know, Edward Snowden. Pardon Daniel Hale. Do a, a, do a rolling student loan forgiveness executive order where you effectively just implemented free college because you say whatever loans you take out, federal government's going to pay for it. Okay, so what world is this guy living in? You know, they always say that they're going to do things like this when they run. Bernie Sanders said he was going to do all kinds of stuff, then promptly rolled over for his good friend Joe. That's a quote. My good friend Joe. It was like a compulsion. He couldn't stop saying how good of a friend that Joe Biden was to him. They always say this. So it's a nice fantasy that, you know, oh, they would uh, go do these things. Well, why don't they do them? Like, answer me that, Kyle Kalinske. Why don't they do them? And what do you think the deciding factor would be between somebody who does and somebody who doesn't? Because it seems to be systematic. Here's my list. I have 10 executive orders. If you want my vote, if you want your agenda to get through, this is what you need to do. If not, I don't want to hear it. I'm out. Now, if you do that, all of a sudden the media is going to kick into gear. They're going to say, oh, this person's with the Republicans. This person is an obstructionist. This person is an extremist, so on and so forth. And the media will shit on you nonstop. But you know what? The people will actually be with you. And I mean, you also make a name for yourself nationally if you do something like this. But as long as you can, if you have a leader, I guarantee you that person can get a group of seven or eight to follow suit. And then all of a sudden you can block any legislation you want. You can make demands. This is the idea of a left Tea Party. It's what we tried to do with Justice Democrats, but all the people we got in there, none of them are leaders. None of them are leaders. And so they get pushed around and their eyes spit in and they're like, okay, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. May I have another please? And it's pathetic. So that's one thing. Just one enforcer would change the game in Washington. That's okay. So what is holding it up? Kyle seems to think it is just, you know, personal character. I think that it has more to do with the system and how this entire system is run. We need to actually end this entire system. And, you know, again, trying to run your efforts out of a corporate controlled party like the Democratic Party, you're setting yourself up for failure from the start. Any successful uh, movement that has actually deeply challenged or even ended capitalism within, you know, certain national borders or whatever, has used a wide variety of struggle tactics, both legal and illegal, to do what they've done. That's just a historical fact. If you got this guy trying to play to his reformist audience, talking about, all we need is, you know, just the right person with character. That's not really ever how this game has been played. And let me say something else. 
Uh, you know, part of the reason I've backed off a little bit from doing these commentaries is I feel like I wind up saying the exact same things over and over and over again. And at a certain point, I just get tired of saying them. Um, I mean, also, it's like it's already there in the other videos, so I don't know why I need to, you know, keep recording new videos. But part of the social democratic failure uh, when they're conceptualizing what's happening in the world is, you know, Kyle made the point before that, yes, unions are a great protection against poverty and unionized workers do tend to have much better conditions. But you know what? A lot of the U.S. labor movement and all of the vigor of that during its real heyday in the past, you know, uh, the 30s, the 40s, and so on, part of that was due to really legit radicals, as well as the international socialist movement that isn't there in the same way today. Now, we're hoping to rebuild some of that, but the point is that social democrats such as Mr. Kalinsky often do not recognize the fact that just the existence of the Soviet Union put a huge amount of pressure on the U.S. you know, to acquiesce to some of the wishes of the working class. I mean, obviously they would crush whatever they could get away with crushing, but it did keep them on their toes significantly in the same way within the domestic economy. Having even 30% unionization, which is where the private sector union membership peaked, that also, because even if everywhere is not unionized, the non-unionized jobs have to compete with the unionized shops. So unions, when they, you know, the more significant a presence they have, uh, it raises the bar for everyone because that becomes the new standard that all the other capitalists have to compete against. Um... So, anyway, just the limitations of this mindset, it's frustrating to me, but that's why we do these videos and try to clue more people in on the deficits. Let's get back to the video. That's one point. Okay, next. Direct issue advocacy at the state level, the local level, and the federal level. If you're sitting on the sidelines, I don't know why you are. What issue do you care most about? Legalizing weed? Get involved with direct issue advocacy. Try to get a vote on it in your state to have legalized marijuana if it's not already legal. Um, fill in the blank. Healthcare? You're uh, Medicare for all activists? If you Let's say you live in a random state. You live in North Dakota. Okay, let's get a group together. Start lobbying to try to get single payer uh, passed in North Dakota. Meet with your representatives. Don't take no for an answer. Find a way. Direct issue advocacy is super important. And at the state level, they'll meet with you. At the city level, they'll meet with you. So whatever your issue is, I don't care what it is. Get involved. Direct issue advocacy is always helpful. Now, beyond that, and this is kind of the, uh, well, I'll say this before I get to the, the big whomper. The other thing we need to do on the left is build solidarity with fellow lefties and expand the coalition and don't get in the way of good work uh, or naysay from the sidelines. So this is what we've really lost sight of on the left is solidarity. That people might not agree with you on 100% of things, doesn't matter. You welcome them in with open arms, you could talk it out among friends and you build that solidarity and don't just sit on the sidelines and lob bombs and act like everybody's stupid because they give a shit and they want to make a change and they're trying even though it's, even if it's a long shot. So that building solidarity is important because right now, you see, there's zero solidarity on the left. Everybody's sniping at everybody else. Everybody hates everybody else. I'm going to pause it there. So I have a number of points to make, but working backwards, maybe we'll jump around. I don't know. But starting with that last point, this is a guy who is barely on the left. And I'm just stating a fact there. This guy is in the rightmost portion of what could be termed the left. I absolutely cannot stand it when basically liberals who are not left try to talk about, oh, the problems with the left. This is one of the things we are, quote, sniping at. You're not even on the fucking left. You speak against socialism. You are for capitalism. Don't give me this shit. Now, going back to the single issue advocacy, I think that that can work. I think that, you know, there's a number of U.S. states which allow 
for uh, direct like citizen voting on different referenda, whether it is, you know, uh, legalizing drugs or raising the minimum wage or something like that. There's quite a few states that let you vote on that. And we've actually seen good progress in a lot of those states voting for minimum wage increases and that kind of thing. So that can really work. And yeah, taking up direct issue advocacy rather than, you know, supporting a candidate or a party. Yes, that can be important. And I do think that on many issues, it is possible for the broad left and even some people kind of in the center. You know, I mean, the Democrats and Republicans are both so far right. There's a lot of things that neither the Republicans nor the Democrats will ever take action on. But that, you know, because they're too far left of those parties. But even the kind of, uh, you know, people we would not consider left at all would support. And, uh, you know, as far as you can get support on some limited issue, go for it. Now, when it comes to the broad left and this other point of, you know, a guy who is sitting on the right wing fringes of the U.S. left talking about, oh, we got to be more inclusive, blah, blah, blah. Shut up. I cannot stand that. So let's, you know, for example, I mentioned internationalism a number of times in this video. It has not been really mentioned at all in the Kyle portion of this video. Now, maybe he's going to get to that. But what we need to do is be significantly more anti-imperialist here in the imperialist core. Yes, we need to make sure, like, for example, let's decommodify housing. Let's start, I think housing is one of the key struggles right now, obviously Medicare for all as well, but you got to understand the United States and Canada and other settler colonial countries get their shit from stolen resources, basically. And, you know, imperialist countries and their client states are getting stuff at discount rates from exploited countries that they should be paying a lot more for if this were any kind of, you know, fair, you know, the kind of capitalism that social Democrats think capitalism is. The prices should be a lot higher. Now, ultimately, we need to do away with that whole system and trade things, you know, without regard to such things. But the point is, for right now, if you just focus on policies which redistribute resources within the imperialist core more evenly, you are completely neglecting the question of how those resources got to, let's say, the United States in the first place. We need to address that on the left. So before we go and open our arms to the right-wingers and other people who, let's remember, Kyle is a white man who, I don't know if he's actually out there involved in IRL organizations, I mean, he has a big spotlight, which offers him a lot of protection. If he needs to defend himself or get a message out, he can hop on the microphone and has almost a million subscribers on YouTube and Twitter and everything else. So for the rest of the people who are involved in organizations that have a few hundred or a few thousand or a few tens of thousands of members, and they're out there doing risky work, yeah, you can't just take an open arms policy to everyone entering your organization. I don't know exactly who and what he's talking about, you know, and addressing those comments too. But for people, again, who are barely on the left, trying to criticize how the left, you know, organizes itself and how we vet, you know, the thing you don't want is for your organization to stand for something, then let in a bunch of people who aren't really interested in those things and boom, your organization now stands for nothing. Now we do need organizations that can educate and bring people around to us, you know, to create socialists, point out to people how if you're working class, it's in your rational self-interest to become a socialist. But, you know, in the process of doing that, uh, you know, there's also different levels of organization. I mean, there's, you know, more the inner circle versus the mass party situation. So there's a lot of nuance to this. But, you know, just simply sitting there kind of on the fringe and trying to police and criticize how, quote, the left does its thing. Chris Hedges does this constantly calling people boutique left. Go shove it up your ass. Like, seriously, 
it's just reeks of elitism. And, you know, again, these are people who are barely involved. So that certainly rubs me the wrong way. Uh, this guy's talking about, you know, how electing better Democrats is going to, well, is anything other than a fantasy in the first place. Yeah, I'm not going to take my cues on, you know, how to organize the left from somebody like that. So let's just get that super clear. And he can complain about it all he wants. I don't fucking give a shit. Proceeding. Well, that's going to get us nowhere. Um, but now the big whomper. The reason why it makes sense to never give up, even when the going gets tough, is because there's always the Hail Mary pass that 100% would work. And what I mean by that is the big dog. If you could actually get a lefty elected to the presidency, people actually understate how powerful the president of the United States is. It's understated by people. Because, oh, we have checks and balances and, you know, uh, the, you have the, what are you going to do when the legislative branch butts heads and then the judicial branch overturns your stuff? And, I mean, it's just, you don't have that much power. You can't do it on your own. Bullshit, you can't do it on your own. So here's a list that I compiled for you. So I honestly can't believe that that's where he went with that. It's just more of this wishful thinking of, like, Elect better Democrats, elect better Democrats, and elect better Democrats to the White House. Boom. That's just, people have been saying that forever. That's not a new thought. And yeah, it's a Hail Mary pass because it's just ridiculous. We need mass movements. We need, yes, leaders, but he's ending this with and just elect somebody to the presidency. Mic drop. I mean, okay, it's just that easy, I guess. I mean, is this the official point where sock Dems have run out of ideas? You want to elect people who are going to do the thing that you want without really addressing the issue of capitalism owning the entire system? And then the final piece is and elect them to the presidency. Wow, I'm super glad I stayed up late for this. I mean, I don't know. Does this go over with people? You know, we tried this with Bernie in the Democratic Party, etc. Again, I'm stating it again. United front of left groups coming together in a coalition to recreate the Bernie moment, but outside the Democratic Party. And then we need to engage in every form of class struggle that is going to be effective, whether it's electoral or non-electoral. But I'm hearing really nothing here. And this video was supposed to be about doomerism. And you're ending with this wild fantasy of, and then we'll elect a president. Like, have you been paying attention to what Bernie did the last two times? Did you not notice that? I don't know. I, I'd now like to just get to the end of this video with help from uh, the American Prospect, David Dayan's um, outlet, where he made a list of, hey, here's all the things a president can do on his or her own. Free every nonviolent drug offender in the country. Legalize marijuana. Eliminate all student loan debt. Pardon Assange, Snowden, Donziger, Daniel Hale. End the wars. You can end all the wars as the commander-in-chief. Close Guantanamo Bay. You can do free college by doing a rolling student loan debt uh, elimination. Cut drug prices. You can do that on your own. Uh, you could use Section 1881A of the Social Security Act to allow access to Medicare for individuals subject to an environmental expo exposure of COVID-19. That's just a long-winded way of saying you could, through executive order, give everybody in the healthcare country. It give, my dyslexia showed up. Give everybody in the country healthcare. You could do it through executive order. And we have we know how you could do it as well, where it's legal. You can bar fossil fuel drilling and mineral, or excuse me, and mining on federal lands and in oceans. You can commute the sentences of all federal prisoners on death row. You could get back into the Iran deal. You can stop sanctioning Venezuela and other countries. You can reverse executive orders that broaden the, the definition of banking and gave us a lot more risk and casino capitalism in our system. You could close the carried interest loophole. You can do postal banking, which is actually a very important idea that would help so many people. So 
the president can do so much if you just get a decent person who's not corrupt, who believes in the right things and has leadership qualities. You can win. So I know this is goofy. I know this is like, you know, it's a cheesy thing, but I always think of whenever I think of how difficult the situation is and how terrible the landscape is right now and how we're so far behind where we need to be. What comes to my mind is Michael Jordan. I honestly just can't believe what I'm hearing. I don't know how Kyle doesn't think that this comes off as like desperate and just like fantasy oriented thinking. This is just not the world we're living in. I'm not saying that the list is wrong. I'm not saying that the president doesn't technically have those powers. He's trying to say it's just a matter of, like, character. Completely sidestepping the entire issue of class struggle and the fact that the U.S. government and the entire political system is oriented around maintaining capitalism. And that a president who did those things, I mean... Okay, yes, in the process of campaigning, you can rally a mass movement and do X, Y, Z, and uh, whatever. Do you think this is going to come out of the Republican Party? No. Do you think that this is going to come out of the Democratic Party? Now, I'm sure that Kyle would say yes, because he doesn't believe that you can do anything really to the left of the Democratic Party. So he's basically trying to sell his audience that... You're going to get a Democrat who's going to do those things. No, you're not. We need a mass movement slash political coalition, a united front of left groups to take on all of the imperialist establishment. That's the Democratic Party. That's the Republican Party. That's definitely the Libertarian Party. Fuck you, every last Libertarian listening to this. And that's whatever other kind of, you know, constitutionalist wingnuts are out there as well in the woodwork. We're witnessing right now a convergence of the far right, a right wing upsurge. They're even trying to pass themselves off as Marxists. Fascism is here. It is sometimes sleeping and sometimes awake, but it's right around the corner to just blasting in your face all day long, uninterrupted. That's where we're at. This motherfucker in his little suit is daydreaming about electing Superman to the presidency. But no, Marxists are the ones who have our head up our asses, apparently. Continuing. And Kobe Bryant and Tiger Woods and like the greatest athletes of all time. Because the thing that made them so great is that when the pressure ramped up, that's when they they raised the, their level. Like MJ had a higher, he had more points in the playoffs than he did in the regular season. And even the later it would go in the playoffs, I think his, his average went up. So in other words, when the pressure's on, when it gets harder, they get even better. And unfortunately, what you see a lot on the left is like, as soon as it gets hard, people are like, ah, fuck it, I give up. But we're done here. Or they want to immediately start from scratch. Like, okay. Something's a little off here, so let's go right back to the drawing board and forget absolutely everything we've built up to this point. You can't, don't reinvent the wheel. You know, you, you go down in the trenches and, and you dig it out of the dirt. Like, you work hard, work harder. And so... Okay, so somebody who has this guy's ear, please teach him terms like opportunism and social chauvinism and just really have him read a bunch of stuff about how imperialism works. Because for a guy who makes his living talking about this Monday through Friday on a you know full-time basis, he seems to genuinely not understand why people like AOC or whoever else in the squad or Bernie Sanders don't follow through on what they're doing or you know what they say they're going to be doing. Their job is to lead people into the Democratic Party. I was willing to give Bernie Sanders a chance because he wasn't a Democrat of, you know, this kind of gate crashing thing. We're going to take over the Democratic Party. OK, great. Except then he didn't. OK, well, you know, chances revoked and we're going back to the Democratic Party has always obstructed any genuine progress that's 
pretty much its reason for existing, actually. But Kyle Kalinske seems confused about the dynamics, as well as the history. I mean, Europe went through this as well. If you read, for example, the history of the Second International, uh, you know, there's plenty of cases of quote-unquote socialists going over to their national bourgeoisie and supporting them in wars, which are basically just wars to enrich themselves and to start colonies across the world. I mean, these are the politics we're talking about. They don't really care about the working class, let alone the global working class. So anyway, and he's using, you know, Tiger Woods metaphor. What the fuck are you on? This is your job. You're a political commentator. I mean, all right, moving on. I think of the greats whenever I look at our barren wasteland of political landscape here. And that's something that gives me, uh, you know, the strength to keep going. If, if anything, I know it sounds weird, but it's almost like you view it as an opportunity. Oh, you're making it harder for me. Great. Time to work even harder and eventually kick your ass. That's the gist of it. And all you need, all you need to make all the change in the world that you can imagine is basically like a New Deal Democrat who is charismatic and likable. That's a very basic thing we oftentimes overlook in politics. Like, are you charismatic and likable? Okay, well, if you're charismatic and likable, then you're going to be a decent politician. (laughs) Even if nothing else is there, on that alone, you could be a decent politician. Okay, I have multiple, multiple problems with this. So first of all, this is more of the social democratic and specifically Kyle Kalinske, not to tar every last sock them with this particular brush, but the total lack of understanding the historical context of where the U.S. New Deal came from. He thinks it was just like a matter of will, like we went from having not a New Deal to just electing the right guy and then got the New Deal. That's not how it happened. There were decades of protracted class struggle. In the 1920s, the U.S. experienced something called the Coal Wars, C-O-A-L. These were shooting wars over capitalist, uh, well, basically setting up mines and trying to get people to work in the mines. The Coal Wars, that happened. Uh, There was the stock market crash, 1929. Maybe you've heard of it. There was the Russian Revolution, and several near misses at other European revolutions at the end of World War I. Capitalism was in crisis, and there were mass movements all over the place. In the U.S., there were the Wobblies, the IWW, which were causing massive shakeups, you know, headlines all over the place as early as 1905. There were all kinds of movements going on that scared the shit out of U.S. capitalists. And even then, a lot of the U.S. capitalist class fought against enacting the New Deal. And then as soon as FDR died, even the Democratic Party started basically backing off of it as far as their support. As fast as they could, anyway, they started backing off of it. Until you get into the 1960s, and there's much less of a focus on any kind of you know, class-based economic demands, moving much more towards a system of individualistic civil rights and kind of those demands. So it was a blip on the radar that came out of decades of often quite violent struggle. That's just the history. And again, it's a struggle that was not just national and local in the United States. It was an international struggle. So if you're not actually willing to create a movement like that again and hook your efforts into other movements around the world, but, you know, and just sit on this podcast and talk about how great it would be to elect some better Democrats, that's not really part of the solution, is it? We need a New Deal Democrat who's charismatic and likable, not insanely overly woke, which turns off the majority of the country. 
What does that mean? Also, is this the Joe Rogan show? Like, what the fuck does woke mean? Just, this is what I said before. People not on the left criticizing the left. How about get the fuck out of the way and stop pretending you are on the left. What are your complaints, Kyle, with, quote, wokeness? Because what I see are people fighting for racial and gender and other kinds of social justice that no one, no person of goodwill would be opposed to. This just sounds like any other right-winger that tries to play up how conservative the U.S. population is. Fuck you. Once more, fuck you. I'm just... We don't need to listen to this. This person is not a leader. So, and as far as the whole charisma thing, you know, quote, they're just going to be a better politician. I mean, that can go against you as well as for you. So I'm not really sure why you're just sort of throwing that in there. But again, this is like a childish view of just how politics work in general, in my opinion. And again, we're going to lead with, you know, I, a white man, I'm going to sit here and tell you why being woke is bad. Forgive me for not giving a shit. Economically leftist and argue for those policies without being a weird niche lefty who's drenched in theory and loves to use scare words that Americans are turned off by. You know what I mean? That's another problem on the left is we have our niche subgroups and we all oftentimes preach to the choir. Like, I want to be in an edgy subgroup. Okay, then you're not going to win. So you got to choose mainstream culture or edgy subculture. If you choose edgy subculture, fine, but don't pretend like you know what you're doing electorally. So I find it super interesting that this guy thinks that he is mainstream culture and not an annoying white dork in a suit who probably most people wouldn't want to listen to for three or four words even. The arrogance is astounding. And at some point, you just have to call it what it is. It's prejudice. It's somebody who just centers himself and can't see past that. So whatever, he'll still be preaching this five, 10 years from now, and it will still be as much of a failure of an idea then as it is now. The rest of us keep organizing, join the quote niche organizations. Again, what does this mean? He doesn't give any specifics. He doesn't really give any rationale except for we ought to appeal to, quote, normal people, parentheses, like me. Dude, you're not normal. Shut the fuck up. And, uh, you know, we need to just do that organizing. And one day, Kyle Kalinske will wake up and realize that we really didn't need him all along. And that, in fact, he stood in our way until we got him out of the way. Him and all the other people like him. You know, you go out there and talk about fucking Lenin all you want. That's not going to win. That's not going to win anything for you. So. So it's funny because this applies to me. I talk about Lenin quite a bit. It's sort of a pillar of the channel here, actually. And you know what I've seen? I've seen tremendous growth and a massive increase in people being interested in exactly the kind of revolution that Lenin helped to create. So that's what I see. And I think that that's only going to increase over the next five to 10 years. That's why I use the hashtag Revolution 2030, because I believe here from the early 2020s that if we dig in now and we start a massive education and agitation and organization campaign, that we can have a major moment within the next 10 years. The same way that the Sock Dems did with Bernie and the same way that the Libertarians did with the Tea Party in the 2000s, going up to 2010, before that. This is our turn. And, you know, like every other oblivious right-winger, Kyle will be left on the outside looking in, and he won't know what happened, because here he is dismissing it. Well, he can dismiss it all he wants. I'm not really affected by that, because what I see is growth in... People actually wanting to know about his specific example, Lenin. And 
I think it'll be too late for him by the time he realizes that not paying attention to what more and more people are in fact getting excited about, the real prospect of ending capitalism, well, I mean, again, he's just, you know, he'll have had his day and then he'll be there speaking against us. Good luck, I guess. You will need it. I would drop all, I, I have no marriage at all to labels. None at all. So socialist, communist, anarchist, whatever, gone, gone, not interested in it at all. I'll call myself a fucking moderate. I'll call myself whatever, as long as I can get in office and implement the policies that'll help Americans. Yeah, so this is Kyle disguising his conservatism, basically. So he wants New Deal social democracy. That is not actually, so, you know, framing it as policies that are going to help people. Yeah. Um, how are you going to get them implemented? Are you going to really do that work? No, you're going to denounce people who are, quote, talking about Lenin, who frankly do a lot of the heavy lifting and did the first time around. You know, sock Dems got their reforms off the back of socialists. Well, fuck you. We're not going to go for that this time. And tell me how leaving capitalists in power is good for people. I do believe that based on things he said in the past, Kyle would oppose an attempt at actually implementing socialism on the basis of, you know, authoritarianism or whatever it may be. This is a guy standing in the way of progress. He just happens to be sort of in the left wing of the block of people standing in the way of progress. But it's like the same mistake that Bernie made. The base was a lot more radical than Bernie himself. People do want a lot more change. And so you got all these clowns out here pandering to the right. This is incorrect. People want much further left change than a lot of people are tapping into. Well, that's their mistake. I'm not going to take it personally because, I mean, while it would be nice to have more people rallying folks on that basis. I hate the word folks, it just seemed to fit. Anyway, folks, it's like my pseudo-populist side for you all. Anyway, uh, you know, while it's nice to see larger channels and, you know, media outlets organizing around more of the correct lines and not being afraid to use terms that most of the world is totally fine with, you know, and that the socialism-phobic United States really needs to fucking get over, to be honest. Well, anyway... Those of us who aren't afraid to rally and organize people, we will do that. And we will rally and organize people. And these people coming out to cast doubt on those efforts, you can be sure that the it's not about that they don't want to win. It's that they're closet right-wingers who don't want that much change. Every time somebody comes out and says, but we got to win, whether it's in support of socialist patriotism or whatever it is, and, you know, socialist patriotism in a country like the United States, not doable for a number of reasons. We've discussed this in the past. Anyway, no matter what it is, all on the basis of, but we got to win. And that's always about playing to conservatives, that whole we got to win argument. You know, basically just pretending that whatever conservative people think is socialism. You're not making conservatism better. You're making socialism worse. And just stop. But anyway, there are those of us sticking to some kind of socialist principles in this process, and we are growing, and we are helping to build a movement as more and more people do get educated about these things and overcome their Cold War programming and generations of lies. I think it's really lazy to say that we're not going to challenge that, but we need to win you're not winning, though. You're actually, by lowering the bar, you're losing by default. Let's move on. So I would drop the edgy, lefty aesthetic, look super mainstream, be charismatic and likable, don't be overly woke, and just go all in on economic leftism and improving everybody's life and pushing for those policies. And then if you win that White House, you can make all the change in the world like that. Boom. It is that easy, folks. This fucking infomercial looking motherfucker 
if you are buying what he's selling, first of all, spot the difference between what he just said and what Caleb Maupin says. Time's up. The difference is nothing. You heard it. Get clean for Gene. Put on a suit. You know, get like a military regulation haircut. Boom. Socialism achieved. That's not how it fucking works. Anyway, clowns. I don't know what else to say. This is clownery. This is buffoonery. Let us, the rest of us, I guess finish the last minute of this video and then return to something more productive. So, the point is, you can never give up. We don't have the luxury of giving up. And by the way, that's exactly what the establishment wants. They want you to give up. They want you to be a nihilist and lob bombs from the sidelines at your fellow lefties. They want you to do that. They Honestly, they want you to waste your time with something that can't even get off the ground, like a, like a third party where you don't even have ballot access. They want you to do that. Yeah, go ahead. Waste all your energy over there where you're never going to move even three inches in the right direction. And great. Wonderful. And you guys fight amongst yourselves and we'll keep rigging the system and winning every time. Literally, what happened with Bernie Sanders? You had a guy who was filling stadiums, had tens of millions of people supporting him. Can you imagine, had he thrown his influence into the Green Party or just formed an independent left labor party? I know that there was a lot to be desired about Bernie Sanders, but let's take an example of somebody who represented, you know, a left-wing domestic agenda and had anti-imperialists in his base. You know, I think that the idea of trying to drag Joe Biden left is laughable. I think the idea of trying to drag Bernie Sanders, somebody in that orbit left, is a little bit more of a thinkable concept. Anyway, you get somebody like that. Well, we know what happened when he threw his weight into the Democratic Party. Disappeared without a trace. That's what happened. So you have this guy. It's like, did he just turn the part of his brain off that's responsible for the memories of the last five years when he's saying this or what? Because we know what happened. And he's ridiculing people who say we need an independent left. When, like, literally, if uh, in the, just the, take the example of the Green Party. And, you know, there's plenty to criticize about the Green Party. They have their sort of right wing hippie capitalist side. But I think that, for example, Howie Hawkins did a fair amount to introduce some actually socialist planks into there. And they're not the only party. But you want a, a mass party that is socialistic and plays by the Bernie rules. Don't take corporate money, all that stuff. If the people who, you know, have ever voiced a complaint about the Green Party had gotten involved in it, it would have enough members to actually do something. So you have all these people who are going to expend a lot of hot air talking about how you can't do third party, blah, blah, blah. If they actually just got involved rather than just standing around fearful of getting involved, you'd have enough people to do something. So again, Bernie Sanders throws his weight into the Democratic Party. Where does it go? Absolutely fucking nowhere. And takes the integrity and money and time of Everybody hitched to that wagon along with it. Great. So where are we now? But again, imagine if that had gone into an independent, non-corporate controlled party. Would we be able to do something that would have a chance of fighting the way that the working class wants, not the controllers of the Democratic Party and the way that they want? Yeah, you would. You would. So we had a chance to do that and it didn't get done. Again, this was just blatant sheepdogging by Bernie Sanders. Well, it's doable. It's been done in other countries around the world. These are lies. I don't know what else to say. These are lies. If you want something independent to come into existence, fucking join it or organize it. But it's a matter of getting involved. You know, I think a lot of people don't understand what getting involved in an organization really is about. If you don't build it, it doesn't happen. That's how it works. So, you know, this whole uh, third parties can't do anything. I agree that third parties 
I mean, even the term, it's, it's like a third party is, uh, you know, sort of a bystander in something. It's called third because, you know, there's two dominant parties. Anyway, an independent left party hasn't crossed the threshold where it can do really significant things at the national level. But that said, look even at the Black Panther Party for the time that it was in its prime, and that's just one example. You can make massive regional waves and make your way, you know, have enough of an impact that you make your way into many history books. It's doable, but people have to stop talking about it and actually fucking do it. This guy is never going to lead you in that direction. He's going to give you daydreams about electing, you know, Tiger Woods to the presidency. I'm sorry, the political Tiger Woods. Anyway, you make your choice. Uh, I can't make it for you. So I don't want to give them what they want, ever. I want to be their worst nightmare. And what I outlined here are some of the ways in which we can be their worst nightmare. Trust me, Kyle, you are never going to be their worst nightmare, ever. In fact, you will try to shit on the heads of people who would be. So don't let the doomerism get you. Don't let the political nihilism get to you. And the final point I'll make is this. Everybody feels it from time to time, of course. On my bad days, I feel like it. Everybody does. Ah, it's useless. Ah, what are we doing? Ah, we're wasting time. Ah, we're not getting anywhere. All that stuff. And the reason why it's so appealing is because it's rational and logical in many respects. But again, it's what they want. And I say, fuck them. And I say, you're going to make it harder for me? Great. It's an opportunity. Now I'll eventually kick your ass. And I'll get there. So you should rededicate yourself when the going gets tough. And what I gave you is a little bit of an outline here. Get involved. Oh, and of course, along with direct action, general strike too. If we could somehow get to the point where there's a general strike, that also can bring colossal change, even without changing the electoral situation where you have your allies in there or whatever. You can force a lot of changes. You just ground the fucking economy to a halt. So that's always an ace up our sleeve as well. Um, but there you have it. No reason to give into the doomerism. No reason to give into the political nihilism. Um, work harder. Don't bitch. Don't moan. Take it on the chin and keep it moving. All right. So this video as a whole and that ending section in particular just reinforced for me that this clown has really no idea, no real understanding of the kinds of forces and processes that he is discussing in this video. Also, as to the earlier thing about, you know, Labels, fuck them, you know, socialist, communist, anarchist. I call myself a moderate. Dude, you know you're none of those things. You're not a socialist, you're not a communist, you're not an anarchist. And in fact, you'd be deeply uncomfortable if anyone labeled you, obviously, very much erroneously as any of those things. You're not that. You were just trying to dissuade people from using, quote, scare words. If we can't talk to people honestly about socialism, Marxism, communism, while using the words socialism, communism, Marxism, you're basically thinking that you're going to trick people into supporting socialism. We have to actually talk about these concepts openly. And only through doing that are we ever going to destigmatize these labels and get people participating in the creation of a better world. If you think that the people's fears are fixed and immutable, and you just can't do anything with them, and hence, quote, we're not going to win. I mean, that's, well, it's just not true. You know, before I go into the value judgments, it's factually incorrect. So, anyway, and then at the end, you get a lazy kind of sloppy, like, oh yeah, and do general strikes, and blah, blah, blah. Like, all this guy wants to do as a social democrat is ride the backs of popular unrest towards regulated capitalism. He is arguing for the compromise position. Social democracy is what capitalists came up with to try to stave off a socialist revolution. That's what this fucking moron is actually arguing for from the jump. That's not a position we would take. Anyway, what position would you take? I'm going to end it here. Leave a comment in the discussion below or, you know, talk about anything else you want to talk about. Hopefully somewhat, you know, on topic for the video and all that. Otherwise, maybe you can find the correct video. But anyway, thanks for listening. Thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month. Every donation is encouraging. Really thank you all for that, as well as uh, being materially helpful. 
like to help out without making a donation, like, share, subscribe, click the notifications bell, and leave a comment, even if it's just good video or thanks. All that helps to boost the channel and the videos in the algorithm, especially sharing it. That uh, puts it in front of potentially large new audiences. So thanks for all of that work. Otherwise, join an organization if there is a good one in your area. Because you know that the Kyle Kalinskis have what they're doing. And we need to get out there to counter some of that. Otherwise, they're going to end up sort of the default leaders of this whole thing. And some kind of change is coming, whether it is fascism, whether it is social democracy, whatever it is. Some would argue that they are, in many respects, one and the same. Anyway, we'll end it here. Thanks again, and we'll catch you in the next video.